Wait, Good wait. evening, world. This is the five Eldrop seconds, five podcast. Seconds. Oh, God. I bet you we're live now. We are live now. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, world. This is the Oil Drop Podcast. This is episode number 34. Motherfuckers act like they forgot about fame. My name is James. I am joined here, as per usual, with the uh, the Core 3 group. So there's myself, Adam, and Rune. Um, December schedule is going to be a little bit wonky here. Um we're, we're usually have the two week break thing, but uh, we're coming at you one week after our last episode. We're going to take a two week break after this, and then I think probably a three week break after this. So we're going to yeah. do this all, all on tonight. A big then, reason for that is Christmas uh, being yeah, right exactly. in the middle of that. Yeah. So I mean, we're just going to do a quick, quick uh, podcast here tonight, sort of uh, going over what's happened over the last week or so. Um, I'm going to just jump right into it. Like there, there's no point in beating around the bush here. So. Sure. Mark Fain has uh, sort of uh, come back into our peripheral vision here, hence the title of the podcast itself. When Davidson comes back, what happens with Fain? What do you guys think? Um, Arun, start. Uh, I'll start this one. Um, you know, Nurse is injured at the moment, so it seems fairly obvious that um, uh, Simpson gets sent down and uh, was it uh, – that, that slot gets filled up. Right now, Fane had a fairly pretty good game, uh, the last one. Um, and it's just a matter of, let's see where the chips fall at that point. But in all likelihood, based upon how management's gone so far, it'll likely be that once all the players are healthy, unlikely to happen, of course, um, it'll be Fane being sent down. Uh, Adam? Well, somebody remembers that uh, since Fane cleared waivers, he has... 30 days or I want to say like six games until he can until he has to clear waivers again something like that mm-hmm. so he can he can clear tomorrow if they wanted to without having to put him through waivers so um I mean if Davidson Davidson is actually going on a trip a road trip apparently so if if he's feeling well enough he's probably gonna draw in for Fane um Benning hasn't really been playing badly enough to come out which normally you know Fane might replace them or Nurse would stay in the lineup and Benning would come out for Davidson. But since he's been playing well enough, it's not really a concern. It's more that Fane's still on the outside looking in. Um, and is very much likely, I think, to be sold at the deadline, if anything, at this rate. Okay, so you think Fane is likely to be sold at the deadline or Benning, just to be clear? Fane. Okay. And at this point in time, you would rather have Benning over Fane? Um, I mean, Benning's proven that he can compete at the NHL level. He's bringing more energy. It's not that I prefer Benning over Fane. It's more that I think management is, has, hasn't had enough evidence that Benning isn't playing as well as Fane could. Okay, no, fair enough. Uh, uh, that's my. A, hmm. Well, when like when Fane comes, like when Davidson comes back, I mean, in a third pairing role, Benning hasn't been bad enough for management to take him out. Yeah, no, for sure. I'd like in a third pairing sort of role with, with Nurse out, you kind of have to play Benning. You know, there, there's not a lot of choice there. Uh, your third pairing becomes what? Benning, and I guess it would be Fane. And um, that's, that's one, it. one thing I did want to point out with all that is, um, no, with, with what's going on with, um, what's his name again? Benning, right? Uh, he is playing extremely protected in it. It's arguably the most protected of the entire team. Yeah, he's got to yeah. be. Yeah. He I is don't know. getting ridiculous number of offensive starts, and he's not. Yeah, he he's getting be. hardly any defensive zone starts or neutral he, zone starts. He's supposed to be our, our third-pairing offensive defenseman. Like, he's playing power play, too. It's, it's just one of those situations where he, he shouldn't be playing anything above third-pairing, and yeah, so he's yeah. going to play third-pairing. Um, what I, I, I will do for next time is, um, once we have a little bit more of a sample size, is look at the quality of competition that he's facing and maybe derive something from that. Because I, I don't think it's very high either, mind you, usually not for third pairing defensemen. No, you know, there's some days where, where Fane is playing and I don't notice him at all. Or sorry, but, not Fane, sorry, Benning. Benning, Benning, yeah. Where Benning is playing and I'm like, either he's playing a really solid, unspectacular game, which is good, or he's, he's just getting these gravy starts, or he just he's getting six minutes of ice time as a defenseman, which yep. Yep. doesn't happen really. Yeah, but yep. yeah, and, so, and it's fairly obvious that while the team has a lot of uh, uh, of faith in him, it's it's that they're really sheltering him at the moment. Oh so, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Something worth mentioning with Davidson. So we obviously have Simpson up. 
Um, we have Jones and Bear who will be in HL next year. We have Nurse uh, playing really well this year. Is Davidson potentially a player that you have to worry about getting injured constantly? Almost like a Tyler Pitlick on defense? Yeah, kind of. Like, how can you not have that sort of entering your, your mindset at this point? I mean, he's... I- He's been injured the whole year. He was injured for a good portion of of last year. I, um, I do want to bring up a defense here, know, though. Man. Like every time he has been injured, it's not his fault. And that, that and that's worth noting too. But at some point, then, like when after you've injured your knee badly enough, yeah. it's not impossible to injure it pretty severely again without something catastrophic happening to it. Even if it's fully healed, it's not. It's not like if you break a bone, it it heals better. Like there are some long term effects. Yeah. So we want as, luck or not. As far as fault, like, honestly, who cares? Whether or not it's his fault, it's kind of irrelevant. It's just that the history is there and the history is being established and health is an ongoing thing for him. You know, Davidson is about 24 years old, I think he is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're pretty 25. closely, yeah, we're pretty much, even as a defenseman, slower developing, blah, blah, blah. We're pretty much at the age where, you know, he likely is what he is. And is that something that you're willing to give up in an expansion draft? Segue. Da, um, da, 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 da. Do we want to we wanna skip over that for this week and then go over that um, on the, the 18th? The next podcast? Because that's a fairly sure. empty topic there. Oh, we could do that in the 18th, yep. Yeah, we, we can do that do on the 18th. Yeah. All, All right, right, so, so that then, topic uh, for the 18th, probably main topic then. Right, okay, go. back of the head then. All right, I got you. So um, according to Elliot Friedman, I'm just going to shift gears here entirely. So yep. what we got here is the Oilers looking apparently to trade Matt Hendricks from the Oilers, um, probably, I guess, by the deadline. Whether or not they are buyers or sellers remains to be seen, but I guess they're trying to get rid of him. So what are your thoughts on that and on the time that Hendricks spent in Edmonton? Uh, keep in mind that he came over in the Devin Dubnik trade. Adam, I'll let you start. Um, I, I think that the Dubnik trade ends up being, I mean, it's 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 a weird one because you can't really say we lost, even though we technically did, because did. Dubnik turned into run. Dubnik turned into a starting goaltender who was playing for Minnesota and playing our, as well as Carey Price right now. But at the same time, Matt Hendricks ended up being a player who played big fourth line minutes, penalty kill, is a leader in the locker room, and we got a goaltender anyway. Like it's it's yeah. it's kind of one of those like we definitely lost that trade, in, but in the grand scheme of things, Matt Hendricks ended up being contributor to the team, um, and I think this is one of those. This is kind of a trade where it's like it's not so much for the team as it is for Hendricks himself. You know, he's had a long career. He's on the tail end of it. He knows that he wants to go back, play his hometown, uh, Minnesota, or his home state of Minnesota, um, give back to the community while he's there. Maybe retire there. You know, build a home. Um, <clears throat> go to a team that's playing really well, might play in the playoffs, and there's no guarantee the Oilers will. Or the other side of that, there's no guarantee he gets in the lineup anymore. Um, with the emergence of Slepyshev and uh, and Pitlick, and we have Pugliarvi playing really well. And it, there's just, well, Pugliarvi's been scratched, but there's there's just enough players that have surpassed him and, have, and players that play the same type of game as him that he's not really needed anymore. So this is definitely much more of a trade for him. And, you know, I hope I kind of hope that if we're in that situation at the deadline where we are sellers or we're buyers, but we can sell him, then maybe we'll get a draft pick out of it and he can go play for Minnesota for a bit. Yeah. Um, I want to add to this, too. Uh, two parts to mine. One has to do sort of with the game tonight. The other one with the whole situation with Hendricks. First one, Dubnik. Yeah, that, that's a that's quite a, a, a goaltender we missed there. Yeah. Um, if you look at that, he has he do, he's not in the leaders for wins in the season, but he's the leaders in the shutout category, and also in save percentage at point nine four, uh, point nine four five. Whoops, point nine four five. Second place being Carey Price. He's also second in goals against average, and this is right up there with like your superstar kind of goaltenders with Carey Price, Tuukka Rask, uh, oh, geez, and then it's all backups from there. Which I find mm-hmm. hilarious. Um, with 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 that being uh, said, obviously a big part of that had to do with David Dubnik turning it around. But there's really no way you can you can go about justifying that we gave up on that we didn't give up on him too early. Uh, we really should have tried, especially when he was a product that we drafted. 
Uh, anyway, bringing it back to talking about Hendrix, I agree completely. Uh, to add to that, we have a bunch of guys uh, that are in the, the minors right now that are making definite cases for finally breaking through and getting playoff spots, but we can't give it to them because of, uh, of roster spots being taken up uh, by Hendrix. And, and to add to that, when Hendrix... Hendrix's biggest claim to fame was that he was really good in his own zone and he was really good on the penalty kill. And our penalty kill was at its best when he wasn't on it. Or he, he was injured, I guess, most accurately. Mm-hmm. Um, because of that, like the the last straw that was uh, was there for him has, has broken through. And rather than scratching him... Um, I can I can agree with this and, and giving him the benefit of the doubt, or, or rather doing something po- positive for him and trading him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I try to separate Hendrix from the trade for Dubnik. I think Adam sort of touched on this a little bit. Yeah, Dubnik is the more valuable player, but we have a pretty good goaltender as it is now anyway, and honestly, we didn't give up a whole bunch for Cam Talbot, so... We lost that trade, Hendricks for Dubnik, but it actually doesn't really hurt me that much. I'm not, I don't dwell on it the way that I dwell, dwell on the Hall for Larson trade. Um, or Petrie. Or P. Oh, jeez. I thought, yeah, that's like P. That, that's Reinhardt. one you can't really. Yeah. Petrie and Reinhardt are the two big ones for me. Yeah, yeah that's that's huge. But, uh, you know, the, the season that we traded Dubnik, when he was with us that year, 2013-14, his his goals against average was 3.36 and his save percentage was 0.894. You want to give goaltenders sufficient time to develop. At this time, he was about 27 or 28 years old. It was honestly like I'm okay with the call that they made. You know, like he Mind is you, what he is. I, I, I do want to add to that wrong. though. Is that he just followed that up like that bad season? He followed it up from a season where he was spectacular and almost carried us to a playoff position. Right, yeah, but the, I mean, he also credits his current success to Sean Burke. So if he had never actually worked with Sean Burke in Arizona, he'd still be playing in the minors. Yeah, True. he did go to the minors for a bit too. So he played yeah. eight games with the Hamilton Bulldogs in 2013-14, and he was like almost he was like. Clinging to the NHL yeah. by the skin of his teeth, you know, like he, he just he, gone. He got score. He got nailed. He absolutely well on, but uh, while playing behind the best defense in the league at the time in Nashville. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like, and then people are saying, "Oh, it's the Oilers' defense," and then he goes to Nashville and just lays a couple disgustingly bad games down. Yeah. So. I think, um, you know, according to Hockey DB here, he, he only played two games with the National Predators, 4.35 GAA, save percentage 0.85. Um, obviously, like, that can happen to anyone on every any given week, but your, your point still stands. Like, you laid a couple of really bad eggs there. So, um, yeah, that's about that for, uh, for Oilers topics for the last week or so. I'm going to oh, shift um... to... Just Earn one more what? thing, uh, G-Sards in chat brings up, uh, okay. in the on the topic of former Oilers, Justin Schultz now has four points in the last three games. Good for him, he's finally being like, used in a yeah. role that he can play. Yeah, He wasn't going to do that here, like, what else do you really want to say? <laughs> he's Not playing, everyone he's playing like, succeeds everywhere. He's yeah. playing 12 to 15 minutes tonight on a third pairing on a team that can afford, that could, that can afford to do that. We could probably afford to do that now, Yeah, but absolutely. we should be... be couldn't at the time and that's you know, like i'm glad that he's doing well he's got but. nine points in 25 games i'm not sure of his ice time per game but i'll bet you it's around 15 minutes that's it is i Probably. think i'd seen a pittsburgh uh you know? fan on reddit posted he was around 14 to 16 minutes in a game max exactly. so you know not to quote craig mctavish here or anything but you know he's no norris candidate but <laughs> given the right circumstances or the right position he can succeed and he can be a contributor to a team. And his last two, five games has been uh, – hold on. His last five games, uh, it's been 19, 21, 15, 18, and 18. See? Yeah, like, so, I, I was even short. So, you yeah. know, maybe maybe he's uh, growing into his role a little bit. I don't know. I don't really know. But anyway. um, Something worth actually we're talking about real quick. Yeah, sure, um, sure. 
Pool and RV being scratched the last couple of games, um, and Slapashev and Pitlick kind of taking over his roles, should Pool RV just be sent down to the oh, NHL? Please. It, yeah, please. please, 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 please. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's actually the right call, but my gut instinct is like, get this guy some prime minutes. Yes. He's, he's drowning. Like, um, he was good, he's, and now... He's, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Go yeah. on. To add to that, like, he's he's improved constantly, and I think rather than letting him sit in the, the press box, but and instead, like, get more adjusted to, to that ice time, um, or the ice space in the AHL level, yes, he's playing easier competition, but still getting used to that ice, uh, the new ice, can mm-hmm. help him immensely because the best part about his game is actually, actually like a huge part about his game is his offensive ability and his playmaking but also another big part about his game is the fact that he's really good in his own zone and he hasn't mm-hmm. been able to show that because he's still getting used to how his own zone's different size yeah and, and i think that's part of it and well if you look at the ahl the condors aren't condors um yeah the condors aren't doing great this year um, Kara is basically carrying the offense for the team, and then he got injured. I don't know if he's back yet, but he was like, he was at a little over a point per game, and he was pretty much the only forward actually scoring. Mm. So not only does it help pull your RV because he gets a bunch of ice time, but it also helps the Condors because they get that player that can score a shit ton of points for them. So. True. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, Mr. Yeah, so... General hockey topics here. Uh, we got two here. So the Florida Panthers have fired their head coach, uh, Gerard Gallant. Um, what are your opinions on this? Because it seems to me when NHL coaches are fired, generally it is talked about, but this has, has really lingered. Everyone has sort of weighed in on this. People have given their opinions. There's been a lot of debate on the internet, on Twitter, on Reddit, on HF boards, uh, Don Cherry weighed in on it. What are your guys' opinion on this on this firing? Uh, Arun, you can start. Mm, the big part about this firing that that everyone is is jumping in on is um, he. It came out of the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is a team that's around 500 without two of his uh, top four or top six centermen and. Um, He's obviously he's not doing great right now, but there are so many other coaches that should be on the hot seat mm-hmm. while he's the one that actually got fired. Like uh, Cap- Capuano, I can't pronounce his goddamn name. The guy, yeah, you, nope, you got it right. Capuano, oh cool. Uh, Capuano, he should have been fired yeah. about uh, uh, ten games ago, and he's still playing and has a huge vote of confidence in his favor. But Gallant, it's just. It's the timing that throws everyone off, and it's hard to find the justification that's there outside of the fact that this isn't their guy, and the way that they were playing last season, understandably they made the playoffs last season, their first in a little bit in a little while. Um, it's it's an unsustainable way of playing. That being said, there's a timing for this, and this was the wrong time for this. It's, yeah, it's I just the common thing. I, I agree with Arun. The timing is just weird. Not only besides the fact that they were around 500, never without Barkov and Huberto, which is going to take a huge hit on any team. Um, they were on the road, and it was right after a game. And it was like, they, you know, he said, you know, Jerry Garland had said, you know, don't make a, a big deal of it. You know, I was just cat- waiting for a taxi, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the taxi it's just, gate. It felt kind of like when when they fired like, Kruger via Skype. Or they didn't have the decency to do it, I don't face to face at that point. At this point, like face, at home, at least where you know we could take a flight somewhere instead of you know dropping off. Oh, we're gonna take the team bus step back to the airport. Go fuck yourself. You can go home. Mm-hmm. Like, and and it, it just seems like they may they may be looking for any excuse to try to. to cause who is the GM again? Um, Talon. Yeah, it's Dale Talon. You. That's how so didn't he take he's over? Not, as, as he's not your run of a mill average GM either. This guy is this guy is one of the best. Right, but he took over as coach too. So not only is he not only a GM, he's coach GM now, and it just seems like like they're. 
I guess there were some rumors floating around saying they want to go Moneyball, and Gerard Gallant had kind of had the opposite opinion on it. So maybe it was, it, it might have been one of those things that something was said before or after the game, and he was fired because of it. But the timing is still just off. Like it just, it's a yeah. weird, weird yeah. thing. Dale Talon is gonna... not the GM. He's not the GM. I forget who it is. Wait, it's not? It's not Dale Talon. No, he was removed back in May of this year. I'm doing a quick Google search. You guys continue. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm not going to give the rumors much weight because uh, rumors yeah. are rumors. I mean, anyone on the internet with a Twitter account can make rumors based upon speculation, based upon, you know, oh, this seems, excuse me, this seems about right. I'm just going to go with this. Uh, Tom Rowe. G Sarts says Tom Rowe is the GM. Right. Thank you. Thank you, G Sarts. Thanks, G Sarts. Uh, we're yeah. we're professionals. Um, so he's the GM and and the coach now. And, and now he's like, the coach. Yeah. It's he's a, he's a big proponent. Him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's a that. he's a big proponent of statistics. Statistics. Yeah. So it might have been that he hired Gallant in this in thinking that Gallant would run with that, and then Gallant opposed it. They didn't have their arguably top forward since game one of the season. Like Jonathan Huberdeau, he's been out. He was yeah. a sixty-point player last year. What what's going to stop him from getting seventy? Like, you know, like sixty-five, seventy was probably kind of a reasonable expectation for him this year. And to lose that is the equivalent of like Taylor Hall going down. Jordan Eberle, Jordan Eberle going down. That's a losing better example. Yeah. yeah, like Jordan Eberle going down, and that's a huge huge Whoa. thing like I, I don't know it's just i agree with, with what you guys had already sort of sort of touched on the timing is what really struck me as odd and the panthers are not an awful team i don't think that they're that bad at all you know it's a tough they're, tough league but what i don't know what else you want me to say they are hyper reliant though on their goaltenders to win them games so what because they have no goal scoring right now. They have they're, no, they're no, no, no. Even in defense, like they let up way more shots than they should. Like Luongo right, but, is what now nah, close to his forties, and they're letting up thirty plus shots a game. Luongo's, I would say he is thirty six. I would say thirty six. Yeah. No way. Yeah, you see, he's up in his late thirties, mid thirties for sure, though. But thirty seven, thirty seven. Yeah, into his forties. Yeah. It's just, it's he's just one of those. Like, because, you know, you see a coach fired, and you can say, okay, I can see that coming from my play. When's uh, the last time you guys saw a coach fired where you go, what the fuck was that all about? Like, even this is, is going to be one of those cases, in my honest opinion, where it's going to be, right now, everyone's going to hold their breath, and the moment that results start coming through, everyone's going to start passing judgment. And that's just that's just how it's gonna be, and there's gonna be follow up from this, obviously. Oilers fan, thank you. Yeah, go Oilers. Hopefully they win today. Um, it's a commenter, sorry. And mm-hmm. it, it's gonna be interesting to see where the chips fall. But at this point, it's just gonna be it's whatever just happens happens, weird. and let's let's see where it goes from there. And there's Super no weird. choice yeah. but for Panthers fans to have confidence in in the decision making even though when it's when Bruce Boudreaux was fired from Anaheim I was very surprised I wasn't because they had had so much success and then fallen off so many times in the playoffs it's kind of like T-Mac with the with the Sharks where it was mm-hmm. um they've had success for so many years but they never actually won anything significant he was, he was other fired than, in like, a year where they did horribly and didn't make the playoffs wasn't he you can mm, you can understand the yeah. reasoning but it's uh, it's a risk for sure. I don't think Anaheim is better without him there. At that point, it's at that point, well, especially with Randy Carlisle, but it's at that point, it's like almost like a shakeup, right? They're trying to change things a little bit. Like I kind of yeah. understand yeah. it, but I don't know. For for this one, it's just it's odd. And also, when was the last time there was a GM that was a coach at the same time? Like, I can't. Even, I don't Kruger, remember. Uh, Mike Tavish. He was intern coach until they hired Todd McClellan. Yeah, that's Todd McClellan. I remember he was coaching, he was coaching uh, with us <laughs> Pat Quinn was coach and GM of the Leafs back in the early 2000s. Ooh. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, maybe like Daryl Sutter, was he ever? I don't think so. Was he ever GM uh, he of never the Leafs? It's, it's weird for the Sutter brothers because one was amazing at coaching and horrible at uh, GMing, and the other one was the, the opposite. It's yeah. Actually. Uh, uh, all right, anyway. anyway. 
Last I'm going to move on. I'm going to yep. move on to our last point here. So uh, about a week ago, the uh, the initial camp roster for Team Canada's World Junior Team was announced. Um, it is in the Reddit post that I put up, so I want you guys to bring up that list of players right now. I know you haven't. Um, so bring that up. And what do you guys expect from the team this year? Who is the team going to be centered around? What do you think our chances are? I'm going to uh, start because I know you guys aren't ready. Yes, thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> so forwards here, uh, Dylan Strom is, is obviously the number one center. Got sent down from the Arizona Coyotes. Um, his NHL future might be worrying a little bit, but we're going to look past that for now. So Strom and then Matthew Barzell obviously being sent down from the New York Islanders. Those are two centers. And then uh, you have people like uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois, Nick Ber- uh, Nick Merkley, sorry, from the Kelowna Rockets, mm-hmm. and uh, Austin Wagner, someone else that I expect to make the team. Tyson Jost, he played in the BCHL last year, the British uh, Columbia Hockey League. It's Junior A, a step below Major Junior. I believe he's playing um, USA College Hockey this year with University of North Dakota, I want to say. That's where Taves went. So uh, I expect him to be on the team. I don't know if they're going to be a super strong team. I like the names that are being thrown around. Um, The goaltending this year is supposed to be extremely strong. Uh, Mm -hmm. From from the Everett Silvertips, there's Carter Hart. He's Mm -hmm. slated to be the the starting goaltender this year, and he's young enough to come back for the 2018 World Juniors if, uh, if he got invited back. He was so, a 98 Oh, my God. Yeah, so Carter Hart from the Everett Silvertips in goal. He's supposed to be quite the quite the prospect. So uh, hopefully that, that's a bit of a steadying presence. And on the blue line, there's only one returnee. That is going to be Thomas Shabbat from uh, St. Mm-hmm. John of the QMJHL. He's an mm-hmm. Ottawa first-round draft pick from 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on the first pairing, I expect him to be joined by Noah Jolson, he is a Montreal first-round draft pick from 2015. And uh, joining them on the blue line, uh, it's tough to say. I don't know about uh, – what was his name here? Samuel Girard. Don't know about him too much. Uh, Jake Bean, Jake I Bean. think, will be on the team. Uh, Dante Brisewa should make the team too. Dante Fabro and Brisewa, Guillaume yeah. Brisois. Um, but Lose these all? things, you know, they're, they're always a bit of a crapshoot. You don't really know what to expect. Mm-hmm. But um, – I don't know. Uh, one thing one thing I do like about this year compared to last year's is um, there's definitely a, a perhaps less politics and a demand for getting players that are actually like draft godlike players. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's still you know the next round of selecting the players for the team because um, that that was what one of the biggest problems right where if a player wasn't actually drafted that high there was a hesitancy to add him to the roster yeah yeah Tyler Benson wasn't invited uh, what wasn't, do you guys make no. of that I think that's a, a, a kind of mistake on on team Canada and then Ethan Bear and um, Caleb Jones were also passed over they were. I was pretty and, surprised about Ethan Bear being passed over. I, you know, I, I guess maybe because if you look at the defense, if you look at the size of all the defensemen, they're all over six foot except for Samuel Girard, who's incredibly quick. He's five nine, and Victor Mady, who's also been known for his shot and his speed, and he's only five ten. Everyone else is over six foot, or six foot or, or larger. With the largest mm-hmm. of them being uh, Philip Myers, who's six six four. And look at the forwards. And they're all also over six foot, except for uh, Dylan Dubé, um, who's Kirk. a ninety-eight er. He's a younger one. No. There's, uh, there's, yeah, Nick Merkley, who's smaller but has shown goal scoring touch. So it looks like Canada is moving towards a big. really big team this year. Yeah, here's the thing, um, though. Like Caleb Jones has twenty-four points in twenty-seven games, and he is six feet and wears one ninety. Yeah. I think I don't I don't know and and you can look at that and say yeah maybe you know he doesn't have enough pedigree behind him because he hasn't shown enough yet I, but it seems like you know they they may have taken a shot at bringing older players but even then that doesn't make sense as to why they didn't invite him like they have a couple ninety they have a bunch of ninety eights in this one um, let's see I thought all the ninety like Jake Beans ninety eight 
uh, Clegu is a 98, Fabro is a 98, Gerard is a 98, Victor M- Mady is a 98. So a lot of the defense are younger. So they may be trying to try to bring up a core of defense that they can then use again next year because a lot of those yeah. guys might not be playing NHL hockey next year. It bodes well for yeah, next year. Yeah, I guess. Mm. So if that's the plan of action, then I guess. But I don't I don't know. Like this year, um, if you think about it, Nolan Patrick is the, the top player. He's obviously uh, in the forward group. But there's not really a whole lot of hype around anyone else coming out of any other country. Um, oh, for the 2017 the, draft? For the tw- for this upcoming draft. So but it might, then again, this upcoming kind of, draft is considered to be one of the weakest there's been in, what, the last well, five years? So. And that's what the last five years have been also been crazy. But yeah. it's also worth noting that it might be that Canada does better than we think just because the the tournament this year might not be as strong as it has been in the past. Caleb Jones mm-hmm. is American. Oh. Uh, right. Seth we Jones. should have known that. Seth Jones is American. Yeah, he's American. Oh, Caleb Jones might play for Team USA then. He might, yeah. He might. He but might. Uh, Ethan Bear, the, the, the Ethan Bear's, I guess, smaller, right? He's a 5'10". Yeah, he's a small he's, guy, yeah. 5'11", so, I think. So that might be those. part of the reason they, he wasn't, but even then, I don't know. It's a little odd. <laughs> Tyler Benson not being invited is a, uh, is a yeah five eleven uh one ninety eight pounds which is actually quite heavy uh for for that size um and for the Seattle Thunderbirds this season he has twenty four points in twenty five games as a defenseman so yeah it's 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 a little that that one's a little worrying as to why he wasn't invited but yeah. I, I think we look at a team with hope and say that they can play better because last year wasn't acceptable last year was awful. Oh, that was awful, but the, we were I due mean, for a bad year. Let's be honest here. Even, even no, but we had bad years up until McDavid and Co. ran the tournament. Yeah. So that year that we won the gold medal with McDavid, we had McDavid, we had Sam Reinhart, we had Griffin Reinhart, we had um, what's his name, Darnell Max Nurse. Max Domi, Darnell Nurse. Um, like holy flying shit, that team was stacked, and we Theodore. barely. The- Theodore was Nurse's deep partner. Like, are you shitting me right now? They're both in yeah. the NHL. They're both in like, the NHL. Like that goaltender was goaltender was was um, Zach Fucali. Yeah, Fucali. Like like that team was uh, it was it was pretty good. Anthony Duclair, Jake Vertanen, who hasn't really he was good for that tournament though. Did Vertanen Vertan didn't invite him back? Did he? Oh, he's not eligible. He's not eligible. He's too old now. But right. um, Joe Joe Hicketts, you remember how he came out of nowhere? Yes, he was. Um, Curtis okay. Lazar was was the captain. I'm uh, gonna jump in that, here, and I, w- I was taking was a quick look at analyzing uh, the top point scorers and who's actually made the team. And among defensemen in the WHL, the highest that I get uh, for the top scoring guy that's been called for for uh, uh, the camp is Kale Clegg uh, for the Brandon Wheat Kings at 18 points in 19 games, which is fairly good, uh, fairly high points per game, at number 20. Mm. Top scorer David Quenville, not called, although I'll have to double-check his age. Um, Connor Hobbs, play- Aaron Ivering, Colton if they're playing, If they're playing the WHL, they, they are eligible. Yeah, all they the might WHLers. Be are we, are we even, back even then to the, the to the old problem where we don't call um, uh, and I, and uh, was it WHLers and we just go for Q, QMJHL and OHL? Um, because right now, like the defensemen in the the WHL, which is a fairly low scoring one, are pouring on points, and <laughs> the highest is a point nine five. Uh, well, there's three uh, players. In, there's three players in WHL. One from the <laughs> OHL. One from the eight from the uh, university, Boston University, and then yeah, 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 five from the QMJHL, and then the offense, and then in the forwards, they're all just kind of mixed. A bunch of OHL, a couple of WHL, and a couple uh, university. So it's 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 very much like it's a mixed crowd, but it seems it seems almost like maybe they really want to go a, a really big defensive core this year mm-hmm. to complement their their maybe offensive power this year. Where where are the games this year? Uh, Montreal. Uh, the pre- preliminary games for Canada are in Toronto. Medal round is in Montreal. 
No. But see, here's the thing, though. Like, if you're going to, like, the senior, like, Olympic level, then, yeah, I can agree with the fact of size. Because these players are all used to playing, like, the other top players in the world that are really fast. But these other ones are used to playing them in the WHL, QMJHL, w, uh, OHL, and, you know, the university uh -huh. leagues. But they're not used to it in, like, X uh, sweet Finnish guy who's who is used to skating around the big hefty defenseman uh, in the the Finnish leagues, right? Yeah, uh, I don't agree with this this ideology that's going on, but I know we're getting a little close to game time, so let's wrap things up. Um, I guess we'll we'll just uh, final. I don't even think we need a final thoughts here. It's just general concerns from us while we're waiting for for things to come through but i guess we'll just uh you know quickly wrap things up i'll let each of you uh close off uh your ideas uh what your name is obviously and uh what you think the score today will be uh first off adam um they're playing the wild tonight yes uh back to back i i don't have any faith in Gustafson, unfortunately i i think I think we lose this one 3-2 in overtime, hopefully. Maybe get a point out of it. Um, that's a win for me on a back-to-back -back night with Gustafson and Annette. Uh, I'm Adam, otherwise known as Street 44722. Okay. I'm James, back-to-back. Uh, -back. Gustafson and Net. Minnesota is literally our kryptonite. I predict a 4-0 loss. 4-0? Um... No, whenever we have those games where it's like, it's, well, we're going to definitely lose this game, we somehow end up with a miracle. Um, okay, I have a little bit more confidence in Gustafson, but it's a back-to-back. -back. We played our hearts out last night. Um, they played a really well, good game. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to... Hopefully, hopefully McDavid can win us the game, but uh, otherwise, I'm guessing a a 1 or 2 nothing uh, shout-out for Dave Nick. Uh, wow, we're some happy bunch here. But anyway, oh, yeah. this has been Arun. Very optimistic. Arunatic 5. Uh, thank you again for joining us for podcast number 34. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks on the 18th and on a, a more earlier time. See ya.